Hand in hand, they approached the town. Calvin, Charles Wallace, and Meg. As they got close enough to see the first houses, they noticed that even they were not so different from the ones they had known. The streets were straight, and all up and down them, to the right and left, as far as they could see, the houses stood small and square and painted gray. Each one had the identical square of lawn in front and an identical number of flowers leading up to the front door. The children in front of the houses were playing as any children might play, bouncing balls and skipping rope. But one thing was very different. They're skipping and bouncing in rhythm. Everyone's doing it exactly the same moment. Then the doors of the houses opened simultaneously and out came women like a row of paper dolls. Together they clapped. And together the children stopped their playing and went into the houses. The doors shut behind them. How can they do it? We couldn't do it that way if we tried. I don't like this. After several blocks, the houses gave way to apartment buildings. Tall, plain, rectangular buildings with each window, each entrance, exactly like every other. And coming to them down the street was a newsboy riding something like a combination bicycle motorcycle. What are you kids doing out on the street? Only Ralph boys are allowed out now. You know that. No, we don't know it. We're strangers here. How about telling us something about this place? You certainly must be strangers here if you don't know anything about us. Everybody knows our city has the best of all central intelligence centers. Our production levels are the highest. Our machines never stop rolling. We are the most oriented city on the planet. What are you quoting from? The manual, of course. All Kemazats knows our record. That's why we are the capital city. And why Central Central Intelligence is located here. That is why it makes its home here. Where is the Central Intelligence Center of yours? Central Central Intelligence. Just keep going and you can't miss it. I must continue my route now, or I will have to account for my timing into the explainer. Wasn't there something funny about the way he talked? As though, well, as though he wasn't really doing the talking. The huge Central Intelligence Building had only one enormous door made of a dull, bronzy material. Do we just knock? There isn't any handle or knob or latch. Let's try knocking anyway. But as Charles raised his hands to knock, the door slid from the top and to each side, splitting into three sections. The children looked in at a great entrance hall of dull, greeny marble. Marble benches lined three of the walls. People were sitting there like statues. Uh, excuse me, sir, uh, but could you tell us what is the procedure around here? Procedure for what? Well, uh, to see whoever is in authority. You present your papers to the A machine. You ought to know that. The A machine? Yes, through that wall. Put your S papers in the B slot. Why are you asking me these stupid questions? Do you think I don't know the answers? You'd better not play any games around here or you'll have to go through the process machine again. And I know you don't want to do that. Do you work here? Oh, no. I run a number one spelling machine on the second grade level. I'm only here to report that one of my letters is jamming. And until it can be properly oiled by an F-grade oiler, there is danger of jammed mines. Strawberry jam or raspberry? Charles? Hmm. I think I shall have to report you. I'm fond of children due to the nature of my work. But rather than run the risk of reprocessing, I must report you. I have been reprocessed once already. And if it happens again, I have to be sent to it, and I don't want to be sent to it. I am sure they won't be too hard on you because of your youth. The man took a card from his pocket and held it against the wall. Suddenly, the wall was no longer there, and the children went into an enormous room lined with machines. They walked down the center of the room. Before them was a platform, and on the platform was a chair. And on the chair was a man. I have been waiting for you, my dears. The voice was gentle and kind, but suddenly Meg realized 
that the man's lips had not moved, that he had not spoken to them with words, but had somehow communicated directly into their brains. The man's eyes were bright and had a reddish glow, and then Meg saw above his head a light. It glowed in the same manner as the eyes, pulsing, throbbing in steady rhythm. No! Meg, don't look at the light! Don't look in his eyes! He'll hypnotize you! Now, my dears, it'll do you no good to try to oppose me. You will soon realize there is no need to fight me. For why should you want to fight someone who is here only to save you pain and trouble? For you, as well as for the rest of all the happy, useful people on this planet. I, in my own strength, am willing to assume all the pain, all the responsibility, all the burdens of thought and decision. We'll make our own decisions, thank you. But of course, and our decisions will be one, yours and mine. Don't you see how much better, how much easier for you that is? Come, let me show you. Let us say the multiplication tables together. Once one is one. Once two is two. Once three is three. No. Once four Mary is had four. Mary had a little lamb. Seven years ago. Once four. 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 Yes. <laughs> if you please, the only reason we are here is because we think our father is here. Can you tell me where to find him? Ah, your father. It is not can I, young lady, but will I? Suddenly, Charles Wallace darted forward and hit the man as hard as he could. Charles! 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 May I ask why you did that? Because you aren't you. You're not what's talking to us. I don't feel anything coming directly from you. I'm not sure where it's coming from, but it it is coming through you. It isn't you. Try to find out who I am, then. I have been trying. Look into my eyes. Look deep within them. And I will tell you. Listen, Meg. I have to find out who he really is. I'm going to hold part of myself back, but you mustn't stop me. But he's stronger than you are. Yes, but I have to try. For father, Meg. And it's not only for him, you know that now. It's the black thing. Charles focused his clear blue eyes on the red ones of the man in the chair. The pupils of his eyes grew smaller and smaller until they seemed to close entirely. Until his eyes were nothing but an opaque blue. Meg felt the small hand that she was holding fall away from hers. And Charles Wallace turned to look up at her with a steady smile that was not his. Meg, we have been all wrong. Mrs. What's it, Mrs. Who, and Mrs. Which have confused us. They are the ones who are really our enemies. We have been fighting our friends and father's friends. Calvin, that isn't Charles. Charles is gone. Shut up a minute, Meg. Okay, Charles. If he is our friend, let him take us to Professor Murray. It is not possible for me to leave here. Charles Wallace will conduct you. Come this way, please. The wall ahead seemed to suddenly dissolve. They passed through it, entering into another corridor. Charles raised his hand. At once they could see through the wall beside them that had been solid the moment before. Here we are. Meg and Charles looked into a small room... In the room was a large, round, transparent column. And inside this column was a man. Father! He doesn't see us. He doesn't hear us. Charles, let me in to Father. If you want to help Father, you must do as I have done and go into it. It's no use, Meg. It's too much for us. But it can't be. Wait, Mrs. Who's glasses? She found them in her pocket and quickly put them on. She stretched out her hand before her and found herself walking through the wall into the cell. Now, wait a minute. You're staying here, old sport. 
and on into the column until at last she was where she had wanted to be for so long. Father! Meg. Oh, Meg, is it you? Yes. Can you see? It's so dark. Here, put on these. She gave Mrs. Hu's glasses to her father. Fumbling, he put them on. Yes. Yes, now I can see. Here, Meg, hold tight. Hold tight as you can. And with Meg's arms wrapped tightly around his neck, Professor Murray forced his way through the cold chill, which was the wall of the column that had contained him. And with one last effort, out through the wall, into the room where Calvin and Charles were waiting. You did very well, but I'm afraid it was only wasted effort. You must come with me now. Your actions have left me no other course than this. We must report directly to it. How they got there, Meg could not remember. She recalled only a blur of corridors and streets and more corridors as this strange Charles Wallace led them to their destination where they now stood. Meg could not believe her eyes. But now she knew at least the answer to many puzzles, the answer to the singleness of rhythm that had been in the playing children and the people in the streets, the source of the voice that had spoken through the newsboy and the man on the bench and was now speaking through Charles. The pulse, the rhythm, was here in this vaulted room so strong that Meg could scarcely breathe against its current. And it was all coming from that single object that now stood before her eyes. A disembodied, living brain. Meg watched helplessly as the brain, only slightly larger than a human brain, pulsed and quivered as it seized and commanded. Her heart now was trying to beat to its rhythm and her breath was fighting to do the same. No, no! Fight it, Meg, fight it! I can't, I can't, I can't fight it! We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. And you see, that's exactly what we have here, complete equality. We are all exactly alike. But no, like and equal are not the same thing at all. Good girl, Meg. Like and equal are two entirely different things. In camisots, we are all equal. In camisots, everybody is the same as everybody else. Meg, say the square root of five. The square root of five is two point two three six. And the square root of seven. The square root of seven of seven, I, I can't hold out. Tesser, sir, Tesser. Yes. Meg felt her father's hand clamp hard around her wrist and with a terrifying jolt, just as the red haze of the room began to seep into her veins, she was once more ripped from where she stood and was plunged into the dark nothing of the Tesseract. Oh, oh no, I, I feel Hush, little one. Don't try to move yet. Oh, I feel so heavy, but so warm. I was so cold. You're so much better now. Do you remember the name you gave me? Aunt Beast? She brought you back to life, Meg. Father and Calvin. We're here, Meg. We're on a safe planet. It's called Ixjil. And slowly it came back to Meg. The violence of the tessering, the freezing cold of the black thing as they passed through, nearly ending her life. The gentle care of this great, great beast with long, waving tentacles and soft indentations for eyes, nose, and mouth. So loving and all comforting. And she also remembered the sad thing for which there seemed no solution. That Charles was still on the dark planet, still lost to the power of it. Father, why were you on Camisots at all? Going to Camisots was a complete accident. I never intended to leave our own solar system. I was heading for Mars. Tessering is even more complicated than we expected. We are trying to work out a plan to rescue Charles Wallace, but... If I tesser and then miss the mark again, I might wander forever from galaxy to galaxy. 
And that would be small help to him. We must try to call Mrs. What's it, Mrs. Who, and Mrs. Which. We've got to ask them to help now. We are here. You understand, Meg, why it's you who must return to Charles? Yes, I think so. I'm the one who is closest to him. I don't understand Charles, but he understands me. Is she strong enough to test her again? Uh, you know what she's been through. If which takes her, she can manage. We cannot assure you of your safety or your success in this venture, or that there will be no danger. But you are not without help. Yes, Meg, for know this, that you have something that it has not. This something is your only weapon. But you must find it for yourself. Goodbye, Meg. Goodbye, dear child. Oh, Aunt Beast, I love you. And I you, little one. Come, Come Meg. 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 Farewell. And she was returned to the spot where the hardest challenge of her life must now be faced. She had found her way once again through the streets and squares, through the buildings and offices of Camasots, and was once more in the place where the battle must be won or lost, there in the dull, red, pulsating presence of it. The brain was on its raised platform, and there beneath crouched the figure of Charles, his eyes fixed, his face expressionless. How nice to have you back, dear sister. We knew that Mrs. What's-It would send you here. She is our friend, you know. No. No, you're lying. Nonsense. You must also know that you have nothing that it doesn't have. That's a lie. You're lying about that, and you're lying about Mrs. What's-It. Mrs. What's-It hates you. No, she loves me. I know that. I know that. And suddenly Meg also knew the thing that she had that could never be a part of it. The power that was hers that it could not withstand. Charles, look at me. I love you, Charles Wallace. I love you. I... The force in the room glowed powerfully in the boy's staring eyes. I... I... I love you, Charles Wallace. Do you hear me? I love you. I love you. And then a shiver ran through the boy. His face looked and strained to see her, and then he slowly rose. Meg, oh, Meg, Meg, I love you, I love you. And he stumbled to her on legs that had not been his own for so long a time and threw himself into her arms. They clung together tightly. A whirl of darkness, an icy cold blast, an angry, resentful howl that seemed to tear through her, then the feel of earth beneath her and something in her arms. Oh, Meg, you saved me. You saved me. Where are we? We're in the twins' vegetable garden, and we landed in the broccoli. <laughs> and there were her father and Calvin hurrying through the darkness toward them, and there, coming across the lawn, were Mother and the twins. Meg, it's bedtime. There's Mother! And then Professor Murray was running across the lawn, Mrs. Murray running toward him, and they were in each other's arms. Everyone oh. began hugging everyone else and laughing. Oh, suddenly, Meg stopped laughing and listened. And Charles listened, too. Oh, my darlings, I'm so sorry we don't have time to say goodbye to you properly. You see, we have to... But they never learned what it was at Mrs. what's -It. Mrs. Who and Mrs. Which had to do, for there was a gust of wind, and they were gone. <laughs> <laughs>